bringing together voices in child and youth healthcare. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, and the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. All right, hello and uh, hello everyone, and welcome today to today's episode of uh, CAFC Presents, or should I say, welcome back? It's been a little bit of a spotty schedule over the uh, over the summer, but I think we're back with our regular. Uh, Regularly packed uh, every Wednesday uh, schedule is back in order uh, now that uh, the summer is pretty much uh, behind us for everyone. My name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centres. And uh, welcome to today's webinar, which is titled Innovations in Pediatric Nursing Care, Making a Difference. Uh, before we get to the presentation, just a couple of quick announcements and uh, and our usual sort of run through to make sure everyone's familiar with our process and knows what to, what to expect. Uh, first, I just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of the upcoming CAFC annual conference uh, this year being held in Calgary, Alberta uh, from October 19th to the, to the 21st. Uh, we do have a conference website at conference.cafc.org that you can get all the information, but uh, this year our theme is is Climbing Mountains, Leadership and Resilience in Pediatric Healthcare. And we're very pleased to announce that it's a great program is uh, is ready to, is is lined up. Uh, all of the information is up on the website about the uh, about the conference program. But we're also happy to to announce that we will have our good friend and, and supporter of CAFC, uh, Alex Billado, Olympic gold medalist Alex Billado, will be there. As will uh, hometown hero, uh, country superstar Paul Brandt. Uh, will also be at the conference, so uh, you certainly don't want to miss any of those presentations as well. Um, you'll also hear uh, during this webinar that this presentation that we're doing today is in fact a precursor to one of the breakfast sessions that will be at the conference, and we'll hear more about that later, where the information and discussion that you hear today will be brought to Calgary for more opportunity to connect with your colleagues and discuss these important issues. Um, as uh, For the webinar, as always, we will take your questions at various times throughout the webinar, so I encourage you to type your questions into the question box as you think of them. Uh, we do have a number of presenters, so uh, if you type them in as you think of them, we'll know which presenter you're directing the question to, and we can make sure we, uh, we answer it appropriately. Uh, you're free to come in and out of the session at any time. It doesn't interrupt the session, and we do record the entire webinar, so you can always go back to the recording and catch up on any parts that you may have missed. The recording and any other resources or documents that uh, are provided to us by our presenters will be posted on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network at ken.cafc.org. Uh, it usually takes a couple of days to get that information up, and you will receive an automated message from the system with a direct link to that page, although you can always use the search function on the CAN to find that information as well. The CAN does also provide for an opportunity uh, for comments for those of you that have uh, have registered an account on the CAN, which is free and for anyone, uh, and you can enter those comments uh, at the bottom of the page, and we encourage you to continue the discussion following this presentation or post any other links or information that you think might be relevant and of interest there. So now let's uh, get on to the presentation here. Uh, I'm just going to introduce our first uh, presenter who's going to then uh, introduce the rest of our, our panel of, uh, I think we have six of us on the panel today. Uh, so I'm happy to, to uh, introduce uh, Nancy uh, Lefevre. Uh, Nancy is the Chief Clinical Executive and Senior Vice President uh, of Knowledge and Practice at St. Elizabeth, uh, which is the St. Elizabeth uh, Healthcare, uh, Home Healthcare Agency. Uh, in this role, she is leading the creation and transfer of wisdom throughout the organization, and Nancy is passionate about creating a healthy work environment that enables academic practice and advances quality of care for all. And Nancy has more than 25 years of experience in North American healthcare, with a focus from community care, from frontline practice to management, as well as the development of new business and clinical leadership. And what she didn't include in her bio was that she's also a member of the CAFC uh, Board of Directors. So uh, welcome, Nancy, and it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Doug. And I'm not sure how I could possibly forget <laughs> to add that I'm the, on the Board of Directors of CAFC. So thanks, everyone, uh, for coming today and to, for joining our first inaugural uh, session. Um, we have a, a good line for you today, and I'm just going to go over the agenda so you know what's going to be happening. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the nursing network and the creation of the nursing network and the history of that for a little bit. Then we're going to move into having a, a real great discussion 
from our experts on the panel looking at the four domains of nursing in terms of education, research, clinical practice, and administration. And I'm just going to take the time now to give a brief introduction of each of our speakers uh, versus doing that at, before each of them speaks, and um, then they'll take it from there. So uh, Dr. Margot Latimer completed a PhD from McGill University and a postdoctorate from Laval University in 2010 in neuroscience. She has held clinical roles at the IWK since beginning her nursing practice in 1989, and these have inspired her research endeavors, which focus on the professional and contextual factors that enhance clinicians' use of evidence with the goal of reducing children's pain, pain experiences. Next, then, we would have, uh, and Margot will be speaking about education across the country. The next we will have Denise Harrison, who's been focusing in on research. And Dr. Harrison is the Chair in Nursing Care of Children, Youth, and Families at CHEO. She's an Assistant Professor at the University of Ottawa School of Nursing there. And she holds an Honorary Research Fellow at Murdoch Children's Research Institute and an Honorary Senior Fellow at the University of Melbourne. Dr. Harrison's research began as a single question, how can we reduce pain during painful procedures in sick babies? So she's going to lead us in a discussion in relation to research. Then we'll be having Jocelyn Vine and Pam Hubley will be speaking together. And Jocelyn is the Vice President of Patient Care at the IWK Center, the Tertiary Pediatric and Women's Center for the Maritimes. And she has worked at the IWK for the past 15 years now. Jocelyn has worked in various healthcare settings, including the private sector. She has a strong interest in active engagement of patients and families as health team members quality and patient safety, interprofessional practice, and evidence-based organizational decision-making. She'll be speaking with Pam, and Pam is the Chief of Professional Practice in Nursing at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and an adjunct professor in the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. She has been a nurse for 25 years, and has a keen interest in children's health, family systems, and professional practice learning environments that foster innovation, through highly effective team collaboration and new models of care. And then to wrap the session up and to facilitate questions and dialogue and engage you in discussing what our next step for the nursing network will be, we have Pat Elliott Miller who will be leading that section. And Pat is the Vice President of Patient-Centered Care and Chief Nursing Executive at CHEO. Pat Miller has over 30 years of experience in healthcare, both in community and hospital settings. She has held a variety of positions from staff nurse, educator, manager, and senior nurse leader. Throughout her career, Pat has been involved at regional, provincial, and national forums addressing professional nursing practice issues and is committed to education and research. And in her, uh, in the past, uh, Pat has been a guest lecturer at the University of Ottawa. Since 2003, she has held the position of Vice President, Patient Services, and Chief Nurse Executive at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, or CHEO. So you have our introduction to our full panel. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and for our panel members for being here. The objectives of our session today are really, as I mentioned, to talk a little bit about the background and the current state of the nursing network of CAPC, to discuss key trends and developments, hot topics and uh, opportunities in the areas of education, research, clinical practice, and administration, and then to really discuss next steps and engage you in that dialogue for the new direction or the next direction for the nursing network. So in terms of the background in relation to the uh, establishment of the CAPC nursing network, some of you maybe uh, have participated three years ago now, I think, or three CAPC conferences ago, where Pat actually initiated a um, coming together or a meeting of nursing leaders from across the country to begin to talk about how we could become, begin to work together on a national level in order to coordinate voices for nurses across Canada in various domains of practice and settings. The following year we had, just last year, we had a follow-up breakfast symposium where we were looking at innovations in nursing, pediatric nursing specifically, again from across the domains of nursing, and at that time had a lot of dialogue around formalizing a bit more the structure of a nursing network for CAPC, engaging with the Canadian Association of Pediatric Nurses as well, 
and looking to see where there will be opportunities for us to support national projects and initiatives that aim to improve pediatric care right across the country. Um, one of our commitments that we made at that point in time was to begin to establish venues for networking opportunities with colleagues and peers from across Canada. And this is the first, uh, first way that we looked at achieving that was by hosting this webinar to begin the dialogue. So really that's that's the background of the network. In addition, one of CAPC's strategic goals in its new strategic plan is to really look at how to engage various partners and members more strongly within the CAPC family. And this is certainly uh, CAPC's desire to have a strong focus on the nursing network within CAPC and more engagement with the nursing network within CAPC. And so this is also one of the vehicles that uh, we're looking to use to be more connected, more representative, and more engaged with, with all of us as nursing members. So, And the plan from this um, session today, once we've finished the session and Pat will facilitate a discussion, the plan will be to engage you in a discussion at the end of this session so that we can really begin to formulate the plan for this, uh, I guess, would be third or second, bre second breakfast symposium that Doug mentioned that will be held in Calgary at the October CAPC conference. So uh, we hope a lot of you will be joining us there, but we look forward to this dialogue today so that we can inform what our focus should be at that second uh, breakfast symposium. And at that point, at this point, I think I'll just uh, stop there and turn the mic over to Margot Latimer. Margot? Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to contribute to this webinar today. today. Oh, and I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, I teach nursing uh, here at Dalhousie University. And uh, I was asked to provide some uh, content around the trends in pediatric nursing education. And so there are 32 nursing schools across Canada. So I've tried to gather a little bit of information uh, across the country and and uh, come up with some sort of oh, trends. So the objectives today for my content will be to review some of the general trends relevant to nursing care, uh, to review university nursing curriculum trends, review uh, one specific trend which is integrated concept-based curriculum, and to provide an example of this approach and do just a bit of a cross-country checkup of who's doing what, and then to review the challenges and evaluating this particular trend. So, of course, when we think about uh, our education trends, we have to consider what's happening in terms of our population changes and who we're considering now in our pediatric nursing populations. And so we have more of a diverse population that we're caring for, there's an increase in community-based care needs. There's also higher acuity uh, in our inpatient populations as well as our community-based populations. Then that comes up, Margot. Just, just you have to choose one of those three options, or else it'll oh, okay. get the red X. It'll keep coming back and bothering you. <laughs> okay. Um, this is not my day, technically, I guess. Uh, so we're also acknowledging that um, there are mental health conditions in children now. Uh, they've always been there. It's just now that now we're uh, acknowledging what they are and addressing the fact that we need to start dealing and treating them. And as well, obesity is an issue now in childhood. As well, there's uh, the technology demands um, in terms of how we teach nursing students, but also what's being used in, um, in the healthcare environment as well. So some of the general education trends are, of course, the demand for more nurses. Uh, as we know, there's a nursing shortage. And uh, so this is driving increasing nursing school enrollments. Um, there's a shortage of faculty, of course, so of co there's inverse relationships here as one goes up, other things go down. So there's a shortage of faculty and especially with pediatric specialty, 
uh, nurses who have advanced education in the area of pediatric nursing. And certainly, um, when you consider all of the um, profile or population profile changes, as I just discussed, um, we're starting to saturate our content in our curriculums because we want our nursing students to know about pediatric pain, um, obesity, mental health, all of these uh, new, not necessarily new conditions, but we have uh, emerging research and so we want to integrate that into our curriculum so the curriculum tend to get uh, saturated. So of course, with increasing nursing enrollments, we also have uh, clinical nursing placement demands. And for those of you who are working in the healthcare environment and work with nursing students, you know uh, we've been struggling over the years to, to be creative with these uh, placement demands. And certainly in Canada, 96% of the nursing programs use an innovative clinical placement uh, strategies, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So some of the trends in nursing curriculums are uh, interprofessional health education. We recognize that we don't work alone, and so we need to uh, help nursing students uh, learn to work with other disciplines while they're in an academic situation. Simulated learning, and of course, um, programs across the country have started to condense their programming from the uh, traditional four-year undergraduate program to either two or three year consecutive month programs. And the trend that I wanted to talk a little bit more uh, about today was the integrative and concept-based curriculum courses. So concept-based curriculum um, is teaching of a core concept and skill by connecting the information around a certain theme or case. So that's sort of the definition, loose definition. A concept-based integrated curriculum is integrating learning of previously distinct areas of nursing. So, for example, um, we may have had, uh, and we still do, in one of our programs here, have distinct courses around maternal, child, and family nursing. But these now are can be integrated into one course, while key concepts relevant to all the areas are highlighted using clinical examples. So in order to give you sort of a, a closer look at what that might mean, uh, here at Dalhousie, uh, we have two sites. Our larger site is in Halifax and the smaller site is in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. And we still have a, for, and I'm talking about sort of the basic undergraduate um, baccalaureate program here. Uh, we currently still have the four-year BSCN, uh, but we are exploring going to a three-year program. And still here at our Halifax site, we offer all of our students the pediatric theory and clinical uh, placements. However, in Yarmouth, we are pilot testing an integrated course of the maternal, child, and family uh, content. And how this might look is uh, in the integrated course, these students will be exposed to theories that are relevant to those three areas. Uh, theories such as attachment theory, family-centered care, developmental strategies, communication patterns, and health promotion. They'll all have uh, a mix of clinical opportunities within that course. And uh, the Calgary Family Assessment Model, which is um, basically a, a communication uh, assessment model for families, is one of the core models that's used in that course. Students uh, will learn about different types of communication and reflect on how pre-verbal babies, infants, children, and parents learn to communicate. And also the focus will be on the relationships uh, that we know are dependent on communication. In uh, my cross-country checkup, uh, our, that integrated course was patterned after, after work that's being done at the University of Calgary. Um, they're sort of one of the trailblazers of this integrated concept-based curriculum. They have a four-year BN, which is eight terms. And I wasn't able to speak with anybody at Calgary, but when uh, you 
uh, consult the website, you can sense that there's a strong sense of community nursing and a focus on preparing nurses for complexity of community care, as well as a focus on nursing populations. And just to give you an idea of what this would look like within their curriculum, this is all available on their website. For example, in Term 4, uh, the focus is on development of nursing knowledge, skills, and competencies for nurses, nursing with families in transition across the lifespan. So if you think back to that integrated maternal child um, and family course, you can see some patterning there. So students are exposed to family systems assessment, uh, family interviewing and communication, and nursing interventions. And their clinical placements for this uh, course will be in community clinics and care centers. Then they move on uh, in the next term to nursing of persons and families in acute health challenges. And again, uh, the topics focused on in terms of health trends and acute illness, injury, and disease within Canada, um, zeroing in on pathophysiology and diagnostic studies and whatnot related to acute health challenges. The clinical placements are across a myriad of units in acute care settings, such as psychiatry, pediatrics, uh, cardiology. And then the term six that follows this has a similar um, setup, but its focus is on chronic health conditions. And then their location of their clinical placements is uh, in areas where patients and families would receive chronic health care. So for University of Toronto, they have a two-year BSCN uh, consecutive month program, and they uh, have maintained uh, pediatric theory and clinical placement for all of their nursing students. Uh, they also have some creativity with their clinical placement, so their students, while doing um, the theory, may not all do an acute care setting, so they may do a, like a daycare setting. University of Ottawa has maintained a four-year BSCN program, and all of their students complete a pediatric theory and clinical content in their third year with a focus on family-centered care of children with acute and chronic illness. So you can see there's quite a mix uh, across the country of um, years of, st of the program, but also the content in terms of pediatric nursing in terms of acute and chronic content and clinical opportunities. If we look just beyond our borders uh, to the uh, Ivy League School of University of Pennsylvania, they have a new integrated baccalaureate. It's a four-year BSCN program and they've chosen a slightly different way to integrate the courses. So pediatric nursing is coupled with mental health and the health of women is coupled with um, health of infants. And the, the um, engagement in the Health of Women and Infants course encourages students to see how global issues affect the health of women across the, the lifespan, but also they've uh, taken integration and concept-based curriculum to a local level as well. So really in these uh, courses, trying to maximize and do sort of value added and in, integrate uh, other aspects of nursing, knowing that the, this content isn't just related to one content area. So as a researcher, of course, I always ask, how do we evaluate some of these trends? How are we going to know that uh, the trend to shorter curriculums or integrated curriculums is going to make a difference? And it's a bit of a nightmare uh, from a research perspective to try and evaluate that. Uh, because there's so many changes at once. Our population needs are changing quickly. The program, uh, as I said, length and content is changing. So it's, it's difficult to determine uh, some measurable outcomes. When I uh, reviewed some of the recent literature around what's happening with this uh, evaluation of integrated concept-based curriculums, one of the um, areas that they're looking at in terms of measurable outcomes for nursing students is around critical thinking, uh, the cost, and knowledge in specific areas of nursing. 
here at Dalhousie, what we're doing is evaluating real time what's happening in terms of as the changes are being made, uh, how is that being rolled out in terms of uh, for students but also for our agencies. And we also are doing some retrospective evaluation with our graduates and the agencies that we work with. So um, this is a short and sweet overview. Hopefully uh, I've shared some new information with you. And I'm really interested as we move to the other areas, but also in the discussion of what, about what's happening in your areas. All right, thanks, Margo. And now we're uh, going to move on to Denise Harrison in Ottawa. Over to you, Denise. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Margo, for that uh, excellent cross-country uh, scan of education. So are you all able to see my screen now? We can see your whole screen, but if you can just play, if we, you can try and play yours in slideshow mode, that'd be great. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That looks better. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on pediatric nursing research in uh, Canada. So first of all, my question is, what are current innovations in research, given this was the overall theme of this presentation? So based on what has been funded, based on what is currently being uh, published and spoken about in conferences and on social media, this list is what I consider to be current innovations in research overall. So e-technology, social media, interprofessional research, use of big data, uh, shared decision making and knowledge translation. But what about current paediatric nursing research priorities in Canada? So two uh, large paediatric nursing research projects that I personally have been involved in, so I know very well, um, Bonnie Stevens' pain management and knowledge translation, um, her series of CIHR team in children's pain, and the ongoing research is, is now in its ninth year. And so that, that's a very large, very, okay. there we go, we're back. A very large, very visible paediatric nursing research uh, project. And a bit newer, psychological outcomes following paediatric intensive care unit admission. So this is still in its early stages. So obviously not very visible yet as it's uh, really data collection has only just started. But what about others? So again, if I look at what's been funded, what's been published, what is being spoken about in conferences, I consider the research priorities to be around mental health, and Margot certainly mentioned this also, childhood obesity, advanced nursing roles, and inequities in health, and whether these relate to race or our social de demographics. However, I wanted to find out a bit more than that. So that's what I assumed, as I said, based on what's been funded, based on what's been published and discussed at conferences. But really, how do we actually find this out? As a researcher, I wanted to know a bit more about what is actually viewed and seen as prior research priorities by paediatric nurses in Canada. So online I went. So first of all, the Canadian Nurses Association, I was looking for information there. And then I went to the National Nursing Professional Associations that have uh, paediatric components or neonatal components. And I went to uh, the eight largest Canadian paediatric hospital websites to see if I could actually find what paediatric nursing research is being looked at. So first of all, let's go to the Canadian Nurses Association. So when I tried to look at research, this actually flipped me immediately off to uh, other research sites. And so the first one was Health Human Resources Network, and I could see what had been recently funded. So this uh, list of five had been uh, most recently funded, and I've actually given you the link there. And then I looked to see was paediatric nursing research visible. So it wasn't actually visible in any of the five priority areas funded, uh, but certainly nurses were part of the team in successful interdisciplinary collaboration in health services and policy research. So this was not led by a nurse, at, but nurses were certainly part of this overall team. 
So then I looked at the national nursing organisations that had, as I said, paediatric or neonatal uh, membership. So the uh, CACCN, or Canadian Association of Critical Care Nurses, uh, I couldn't find any paediatric nursing research that was actually visible on their site. So Canadian Association of Neonatal Nurses, and there was this uh, excellent statement about promoting knowledge translation for effective and innovative approach to neonatal nursing practice and change in health policy. So this, this made me excited that this statement was very visible, but that actual research wasn't visible in the site. And then Catwin, the Canadian Association of Perinatal and Women's Health Nurses, uh, up front uh, in their statement was that they're involved in cutting edge research, but when I tried to actually look for the research topics, they weren't visible either. So I didn't really get a lot of information from our national nursing organisations. So then I did a cross-Canada check, so an online scan of Canadian paediatric hospitals. So very simple method, all I did was in Google, I typed in the hospital name and nursing research and I classified uh, the research as highly visible if nursing research came up in first search or uh, partly visible if I really had to look um, within these sites for nursing research. And then if I could tell the topic, I would document the topics or the themes or the priorities as well. And I only chose the, uh, the eight largest for the purpose of this, knowing full well that there's a lot more um, paediatric hospitals as well. So this was just really a first go. So as you can see here, I have the hospitals, the eight large paediatric hospitals in alphabetical order, where the paediatric nursing research was highly visible, somewhat visible in the research areas. So as you can see, Alberta Children's and BC Children's uh, weren't visible, and this is not to say they're not there, it's just I couldn't find them on a simple search. Uh, CHEO was visible and research areas were around knowledge translation. Hospital for Sick Children's, visible research areas around knowledge translation and pain management. IWK wasn't highly visible, but it was there and the research areas were clear once I started looking. So that was around pain management and nurses' work life. Manitoba was highly visible, but the research areas and topics weren't there. Uh, Montreal Children's, I couldn't find St Justine's. Uh, is was extremely highly visible and thanks to Syl Sylvie LeMay, and I'm just bringing this over here now, so when I typed in my search, uh, Sylvie LeMay came up absolutely front and centre. So she gets a great big yes for her uh, visibility at St Justine's and pain management came up as one of the uh, priority areas. So from our cross-country online scan, I was unable to clearly establish uh, what the paediatric, or who were the paediatric nursing research leaders, what is Innovative Paediatric Nursing Research Canada, and the research priorities. And I certainly also uh, really couldn't find, although it's much harder to search in a strategic plan, organised manner, about paediatric nurse research's use of social media. So I just want to go off topic for a minute and put the question out there to all of you. Does your nursing research team use social media to share work or disseminate uh, research? So if you can answer uh, yes, no or unsure in the box that uh, Doug is going to put up, that would be great and we look forward to seeing your responses. All right, so everyone should see the uh, the poll question up on their screen now, and this is your opportunity to just click on the screen to select your answer. So the one of the three answers of yes, no, or unsure, and we can see most of the people are uh, responding. So we'll turn around those results in just a second after we give everyone a second to okay. So there's the results. We've got 65% have said no that they don't. Their their nursing team does not use social media. 15% said yes, and 20% were unsure. Okay, great. And you'll notice I just did put the real social media sites up there, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube, rather than LinkedIn and ResearchGate. I classify LinkedIn and ResearchGate as, I mean, they are social media, but they're far more focused on uh, professional um, 
information sharing rather than public social dissemination. So thank you for that, that's uh, really interesting. So let's return to what are current paediatric nursing research priorities. And so lo looking at what other people do, as I said, I really couldn't find in Canada what they are. But this is a really interesting study um, conducted in Ireland. So they actually looked at, did three rounds of uh, Delphi study looking at priorities for children's nursing in Ireland. And so I'm going to drag this across in a minute. And so basically, oh, sorry, I'll drag it back across in a minute. So the top three paediatric nursing research priorities in Ireland based on three rounds of Delphi surveys were recognition and care of the deteriorating child, safe transfer of the critically ill child between acute healthcare facilities, and child and family's perceptions of care at end of life. So they were the top three nursing research uh, topics, and then I'll pull this back again. And you, you can see here that the uh, priority themes for nursing, uh, for research in children's nursing are uh, ranked as research, resuscitation concerns, critical care concerns, end of life care, childhood pain, chronic illness, family centre care, nurses' role in care delivery, infection control concerns and adolescent concerns. So I actually thought this was a very nicely conducted study and the authors go on to say that this list of priorities is now being used to, um, to help uh, universities affiliated with children's hospitals pick out like, such as master's research topics and it really helps to them to coordinate their research efforts and to lobby uh, funding sources for why their research is important because they're uh, it's one of the priorities actually identified by the paediatric nurses in the country. So I'm going to put a question out to all of you again. And certainly this is a super, super, very informal, uh, not classified, classified really as Delphi method at all, but while I've got an audience, I want you to consider, so very quickly off the top of your head without really thinking deeply about it, what topic do you consider or theme to be the top paediatric nursing research priority? And if you uh, have a minute to write comments, that would be great. Sorry, Doug? Yeah, so just to, in order to answer this question, we'll just get you to type your responses into the question box and we'll, uh, we'll see what everyone uh, has to say about this uh, and what do you consider uh, to be the top pediatric nursing research priority. So just give your, your top choice, type it into the question box and we'll, uh, we'll see what the audience thinks. We'll give everyone just a second to, uh, to type. So we've got Mental health has come up a few times. We've got interdisciplinary communications, a few more mental health, uh, early warning of deteriorating child, uh, transitions, one vote for pain. Not a lot of clustering. There's a lot of individual responses, so a lot of lots of diversity and variety uh, out there coming in. So. Uh, priority uh, is uh, communicating with children with special needs. Managing the medically fragile uh, ch children and their families, relationships with patients and families. So again, lots of variety. So an another vote for transition to adult care. Yeah. Yeah, so feel free to uh, continue to type those in, uh, and, and uh, we'll uh, certainly let the speakers know what your what your thoughts were in this area. But uh, we can hand it back over to you, Denise. Okay, thank you very much. So what I'm going to do with that is after this, um, we will collect all this information and I would really, and I'll work uh, with some volunteers and uh, Margot, I've just volunteered you also. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? To really um, prioritise these priorities and to try and group them in themes and bring it back to you as an audience to uh, carry this further. 
So moving more on to education now, to undertake innovative nursing research, we need a current and future pool of researchers. And so I looked at the Canadian Institute for Health Information's annual report. And again, thank you, Margot, for directing me to this site. I weren't quite sure where to start looking for this education information. So as you can see from 2009 up to 2013, there has been a slight increase a proportion of nurses, registered nurses, with a master's or doctorate. But it's still relatively low. And just for a minute, we're just going to compare with our psychology colleagues. And uh, Margot and I are members of the CHR Strategic Training uh, Initiative Group in Pain in Child Health. And certainly there's more psychologists than uh, any other professions in this group. And so they have to do a PhD. So, of course, there's a lot, basically 100% of uh, registered clinical psychologists have doctorates. And so it's a very different uh, workforce. I'm not saying we need to do that. I'm just comparing with our other group that also do a lot of uh, pediatric research. So it's relatively low. So that's the uh, currently registered. And then I thought I would look at actually uh, graduates for masters and doctoral programs in Canada to see is the trend increasing, decreasing, staying the same for actually graduating. So you'll see here that the uh, trends for really haven't changed much since 2008. And in fact, since 2012, there were certainly less doctoral prepared uh, nurses graduating from uh, programs in Canada. So we're not really at this stage going to see a big increase uh, in any time soon in our uh, high degree graduates in nursing, let alone paediatric nursing. There's also a trend in some universities towards non-thesis uh, masters. And so this again results in reduced PhD admissions because if you don't do a thesis masters, you're less able to do a, um, a doctoral thesis. So this will result in reduced PhD admissions and reduced expertise. So I just put up there, is there a role, and I, I really think there is, but the role of uh, an honours programs in our undergraduate degrees, and there's actually very few in Canada. So certainly Alberta Children's has one of the very few, Brock does, and there's obviously others, but there's really not many. And so the great advantage with an honours program is you do do a thesis and it really sets you up for being able to actually conduct and uh, do and publish and present high quality research. So the challenges, just going back to where I started, visibility of nurse researchers, we're not a very visible group. Our research training, as I showed you, we're not really increasing our, our research training in our nurses. And what about career? The roles are quite limited. There's very few roles which combine academia and clinical um, care and uh, built-in research time in clinical roles is still very limited for um, nurses. So in conclusion, paediatric nursing research in Canada has variable, variable visibility. Research priorities are unknown, but can certainly be established. So I think we went part of the way today to at least with this audience look at the research priorities. And this is something that can certainly be established and I'll be very interested in are working on this with a group of you who are interested, so let me know. Uh, so the question, are we innovative in our nursing research? I'm going to leave that totally open and I certainly think there's a lot of uh, innovations happening. We just need to make sure that they are a bit more visible. And uh, thank you and I'm happy to take any questions either now while we flip to our next speakers or after the presentation. Denise, um, we don't have any questions right now, but that's certainly my opportunity to remind the audience to type your questions in as you think of them. We are going to hear from uh, Pam Hubley and Jocelyn Vine next, and then we'll be getting into a more fulsome uh, question period. Uh, but if you do have any questions, please do uh, remember to type them in as you think of them. And uh, while we're waiting for any questions to come in, we'll hand the virtual podium over to Jocelyn Vine and Pam Hubley. 
Well, thank you so much. That was that was absolutely excellent. Very, very interesting conversation around research. So thank you so much, uh, Denise. Yes, thanks very much. I think it uh, makes us all think about uh, how we can move forward together. We, um, it's Pam here in Toronto, and I'm uh, pleased to start off. Jocelyn and I will be working together on this uh, next section of the presentation, focusing on pediatric nursing administrative and practice hot topics. One of the areas where we think there is a lot of uh, attention, as well as uh, interest and opportunity, is in the area of maximizing scopes of practice across teams. Certainly, uh, in very diverse work environments, we are hearing of teams of different professionals who are coming together to meet the needs of patients, and the concept of interdisciplinary teams is not necessarily new, but certainly uh, receiving a lot of attention and encouragement as uh, we hear about interdisciplinary um, and interprofessional collaboration not only in practice but in research or in research and education as well. One of the uh, things to pay attention to in terms of interdisciplinary roles and teams is that uh, this poses some unique and overlapping scopes of practice. So there could be some challenges in the clinical environment as we determine what um, professional can provide the best um, fit for the needs of the patient. So this brings us to thinking about how do scopes of practice overlap, where are their unique skill sets, and how do we encourage and build teams so that there's some flexibility among a team to uh, contribute in a way that recognizes this sensitivity to uniqueness and overlapping scope. We think it's really important that interdisciplinary teams uh, evolve and develop uh, with the capacity to foster learning um, so that they are adaptive and responsive to the unfolding needs of our patients. And that flexibility, flexibility and responsiveness to patient needs, I think, is going to be the continued cornerstone of how we plan our health human resources uh, for the teams that, uh, that we are supporting. There's certainly a lot of attention being paid to how to create highly effective teams, and there's literature in this area uh, to help leaders think through and put systems and processes in place that enhance communication, uh, trust among leaders, that foster the development of change leaders, and really encourage and value evidence-based uh, practice and decision making. In this area, uh, the patient safety movement has certainly gained a lot of traction and I think is on the, um, the tip of the conversation in most organizations and many of us are striving to be considered highly reliable organizations. This is an area of interest, I think, for many institutions and an area where nurses really have been providing a lot of leadership. The other uh, thing that is um, really important in this context is to really focus in on patient experience as a driver of uh, care and our care systems and processes. And I think for nurses, this is a wonderful fit because for many, many years, we have had a very patient-centered uh, focus to the work that we're doing, but we're being challenged more and more from different um, perspectives to really think and redesign systems with the patient voice front and center and in partnership. And I heard a lovely um, conversation about this last year at the IHI, Institution for Healthcare Improvement, a conference talking about the flip and moving us from thinking about how we provide care based on our own assumptions and our provider-driven um, approach to flipping to new ways and redesigning, rethinking care that really has that patient voice and the patient expectations for care um, driving how we design systems. I thought the flip was a really nice way to rethink about uh, this challenge of shifting from a provider-driven to a patient-driven 
uh, system because we do need to flip uh, our own perspectives, flip our team's perspectives, and really flip how we um, engage in conversations that uncover what the patient's needs are and the patient's perspective for a high quality experience. While we're thinking about maximizing scopes of practice across teams, we really need to be cognizant of the complexity and the continuity of care issues that we're faced with today. And I think uh, many of our systems, while we have been moving towards uh, improvements in streamlining care and efficiencies of care, um, we have developed um, an emphasis on episodic care and we're very focused on giving high quality, very good care at the time and the place where the patient needs that immediate care. But I don't think we're so good at thinking about the whole trajectory of care and how all of the episodes of care connect to provide the whole experience of care. And this is particularly evident um, in patients with highly complex needs and who require ongoing um, care within the system and particularly across a variety of different settings. It's Jocelyn here. I'll speak a little bit about some of the work that uh, has been going on in our local area and as we open it up for questions, others can speak to some of the experiences that they have uh, undertaken. So going into further discussion around the trends uh, a real focus on a structured and ongoing process for assessing staffing skill mix that's based on existing patient data and patient trending data, uh, consideration of staff experience. Um, as Pam already spoke to, maximizing scopes of practice for all professions and really making sure that the, the full capacity of individuals is tapped <clears throat> and that talents are maximized because as we all would would agree I'm pretty certain that there is no shortage of work so using all of the talents across the team is more critical than ever. With a, a focus on inpatient care teams to start with uh, again maximizing the scopes of practice for registered nurses has been a particular area of focus and continues to be an area that requires investment uh, based on the experiences that we have here uh, in Halifax and, and in Nova Scotia in general. So I think as we've introduced additional um, providers into the healthcare system uh, such as assistive roles and, and the enhanced um, clinical practice area for licensed practical nurses, I do think that um, it signals a, a real need to focus on uh, maximizing and continuing to build the scope of practice for registered nurses and, uh, and really does uh, require a focus strategy. Um, based on the work that we've done here at the IWK and in Nova Scotia, um, we've used four key domains as the, as the areas that we focus on in developing the model of care or service delivery, uh, whether it's an inpatient or an ambulatory setting. Uh, and those four domains are people, processes, information, and technology enablers. So this just shows you the schematic and some of the key points under each of those uh, four domains. And also in the four corners, you'll notice other elements that we believe are absolutely critical in order to be successful with uh, identifying uh, the most appropriate model of care and um, really making sure that it's well embedded and well supported within the various care teams. Um, just a little bit of a, of a description of some of the work that we've done here. Um, we have three main clinical areas, so the mental health and addictions, children's health, and women's and newborn health. And prior to starting to go into a, a fairly detailed and structured process in order to come up with the service delivery models that we felt were most appropriate for the patients and families we were serving, in two of the areas, we had a very strong nursing presence uh, in women's and newborn health and in children's health. Whereas in mental health and addictions, in general, the balance of nurses was very, very minimal, as was licensed healthcare providers in general. 
So that led to um, some major um, and profound changes in the mental health and addictions program. And I think that using this framework was really instrumental in some very substantial um, improvements in patient care. And it did lead to some tweaking and some relatively small changes in the model of care within the other two areas, children's health and women's and newborn health. But we did find this framework to be very, very good. And one of the things that's most important about it, I think, is it highlights all of the pieces that need to be in place and really broadens the thinking of the teams as they really look at what they're doing, how they're doing it, and, and who's the best, uh, most appropriate people to be involved. I will make one other comment in this um, particular um, aspect, and that is around the domains of technology and information. And it goes back to the point that Pam was making on the previous uh, slide that she mentioned, and that is really looking at the trajectory of patient care and the patient journey and what the information and technology enablers are that are so important in improving the linkages that, that patients and families need. And that, I think, continues to be a very significant gap area for us and certainly, uh, in my opinion, a, a real opportunity area for continued investment. So I'd be interested at the end of the presentation to hear what others' observations are around that, but I, I perceive this to be a major uh, struggle and uh, a need for focus in that domain. We certainly see that um, family and patient-led care models are a, an opportunity for us uh, to continue to support and evolve. I think um, there's, there's probably good examples across many organizations of how patients and families and providers have partnered but um, these little pockets need to really be exploded so that we can share our strategies and uh, really capitalize on the opportunity um, to engage um, with, with families who are really interested in helping us design our care. Jocelyn, did you want to talk a bit more about that? Uh, I think I think that the examples that we have listed here, and, and I'm sure there's many others, we, we wanted to keep it fairly confined, but um, examples of patient uh, and family-led um, initiatives, the always together approach within NICU, really strengthening the environment for care that to enable parents, mothers and fathers, um, in order to have them live in and, and take over as the main provider for their um, premature baby as early as possible. So really, I think that the flip um, phrase that that um, Pam used earlier uh, really applies to this as well. Uh, we, we always know that our job is to be coach and teacher for our patients and families, but uh, what, I, what I think uh, is showing remarkable promise is uh, having that flip happen a lot earlier in the journey of care. And, uh, and really showing some incredibly promising results in, uh, in the research regarding um, infection rates, uh, parent capacity, and um, also decreased lengths of stay. Uh, another area that um, has been incredibly uh, uh, well received has been the leadership that uh, our youth at the IWK have been providing. And, uh, and how much providers themselves are embracing being educated by youth leaders about what works for them. And I think uh, within, uh, I think there's opportunities to be constantly strengthening the cultural sensitivity and skills in dealing with adolescents. Uh, and so I, I see this as, a, as an excellent uh, example of leadership provided by uh, the people we serve. And at SickKids, we've had some wonderful opportunities to change the way we do nursing handover. Uh, and this really was prompted through the voice of our um, Child and Family Advisory Committee when we did some assessments on what uh, concerns they had, what beliefs they had about how uh, to make improvements to care for themselves as parents and for children. One of the priority practices that uh, rose to the top that, that uh, they recommended we pay attention to 
was engaging families as equal partners in nursing handover. And while we have had uh, family presence during rounds and family members engaged in uh, interdisciplinary rounds uh, at the hospital for some time, the idea of engaging directly with families um, and including families in the one-to-one -one handover from nurse to nurse at each shift uh, was a pretty new and uh, sometimes challenging way to think about doing the work that we do. So we've had a concerted effort in partnership with uh, our Child and um, Child-Centered Family Advisory Committee um, to advance this approach and we're seeing really excellent results in the units that have embraced this and started to have uh, family presence and participation during nursing handover and we're now hearing from uh, our colleague nurses you know comments like why didn't we do this sooner we should have been doing this before this is so much better for patient safety um, many many comments from our nursing staff that are supportive of this endeavor and certainly many comments from uh, uh, patients uh, and parents who want to be engaged and participate, who have information to share, who know their child uh, extremely well and want to be sure that there's a consistent uh, uh, voice at the table to, um, to highlight the things that they think are important. Some of those are treatment related, some of those are communication related. Some of those are things that uh, family members just think are really important for our staff to know about the, the child in the current context that they're in to maximize healing and uh, to promote um, their well-being. So we're really delighted with this opportunity and I have to give full credit to our Child and uh, Family Advisory Committee for setting this up uh, as a priority and uh, raising their voice and letting us know this was important to them, and then acknowledgement to our uh, hospital leadership team for hearing that and sorting out together how we were going to do this. So this is a really lovely example for us of how we were able to um, co-design, co-create, and um, advance an idea in partnership with, with families that really has had a fairly significant impact on the way we do things, and we're feeling now that the way we're doing things is better than the way before. Another area we thought that was really important um, in terms of administrative and practice um, priorities for us right now in nursing is the focus on transitions and complex care continuity. Um, I think this, this came up um, in the poll you did, Denise, with uh, an interest in some research priorities around transitions. We're certainly seeing that there are um, transition-related um, issues and concerns we're hearing from children and family across different points of transfer at different developmental and age milestones, certainly some uh, times gaps in information communication across different services or programs. And as we know, we're seeing children uh, and youth who are being served in a variety of different settings and not, are, not always are, are different um, organizations well connected in terms of information sharing and communication. And patients are really being um, the core navigators uh, of their own care in many ways, which on one hand I think is, is important and is good in terms of um, supporting self-management, empowerment, and control over one's own uh, health journey. At the same time, we're hearing from patients and families how frustrating it is to um, not have uh, good connecting points um, between different services and programs. And sometimes that's within one organization, and sometimes that's across multiple organizations. So an area for us to really um, look to improve um, we've talked on the idea of partnership and how important that is, and I think the concept of self-management is really starting to embed itself. Um, for pediatric nurses, we have always been paying attention, I think, to not only the advocacy of, of children and families, but the opportunities to provide anticipatory guidance and help support 
the educational needs of uh, children and families so that they can be uh, comfortable with the care requirements that they have and in charge of their own uh, care journey. So we have been paying attention to this, but I think so more and more there's good opportunities for us to support that and to um, help our nursing teams find ways to communicate and engage with um, our patients and families so that they are in control and managing their care. We can also change some of our systems to support that so they're not as dependent on us. There's opportunities for us to improve care linkages and processes across our various settings, the co-design and co-creation of new programs and new uh, care pathways is, is ripe for us and I think nurses have really shown a lot of leadership in this and really can rise uh, even further uh, in this area. While we are um, doing that, I think there's an important need for us to pay attention to caregivers. As we have transitioned a lot of our care into the home and into the community, we're certainly hearing um, from some of our families about the burden that that places on family members. So thinking uh, from a holistic and family perspective how we can support caregivers uh, in addition to um, the child and youth is going to be something for us to really pay attention to. And one of the things we wanted to highlight was just the opportunity for us as nurses to be um, using evidence-based practice and using guidelines to support best practices. And here in Ontario, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario um, has had a concerted effort to develop um, guidelines that are relevant to nursing practice. And they have recently published a care transitions best practice guideline, which really can help us guide um, our planning, our care, uh, and our systems evolution to enhance care transitions. So we just wanted to bring that uh, to your attention. Another area that is uh, really hot on the radar screen is the opportunity to enhance nursing leadership roles. And when we say this, we're talking about the, the nursing leadership that comes from a variety of different perspectives. Sometimes uh, we have emphasized leadership in conjunction with management roles, but what we're talking about is the uh, intention and the opportunity to emphasize nursing leadership across a whole variety of roles and advocate for the need to have um, teams working together that uh, have multiple points of view and where those multiple points of view and expertise can contribute to designing systems and improving systems. It's really important for us to be working together and tapping into the knowledge of our clinical nurse specialists, our nurse practitioners, evolving case manager roles and navigator roles, really enhancing and supporting educators to uh, enable and build capacity for ongoing knowledge to care for patients um, with evidence informed, um, in an evidence informed manner. It's really important for us to be thinking about informatics and tapping into our nurse colleague experts who have the um, understanding of clinical systems and uh, informatics and technology as we advance uh, forward. And of course, the opportunities to engage in research and build nurse scientists. Um, clearly, from what Denise shared with us, we have uh, some work to do to create uh, environments uh, that support uh, nurse researchers and are, that are clinically connected to nurse researchers and scientists. Um, and we also have an opportunity to develop more pediatric-focused nurse researchers. Of course, our clinical managers and directors are essential leaders in the system, um, and we want to ensure that we continue to have managers and directors working in organizations, but keep them connected to the clinical entity and maximize not only their sort of managerial perspective, but keep them engaged and embedded in the clinical priorities. And part of the way to do that is using all of these different roles um, and maximizing and synergizing the expert view from these different lenses. We just wanted to highlight that uh, the Canadian Nurses Association has certainly done some work to um, advance frameworks for thinking about how to introduce some of these roles. So um, 
a second edition of the Advanced Nursing Practice Framework was um, uh, released in 2008. And more recently, just uh, this summer, the Pan-Canadian Core Competencies for the Clinical Nurse Specialist report was released. So our national leadership organization is doing some good work that helps us as nurse leaders in the um, field of, of administration and uh, care to think about who do we need to have and what roles do we need to create for the future to ensure a robust um, healthcare system. With regard to mental health, um, both Pam and I were completely aligned on this being an important uh, trend to focus on. Given the, the breadth of the demand and the need um, and also the, the need to really build capacity, I think there's a huge opportunity for um, nursing roles within the domain of mental health and addictions care for children and adolescents. And, um, and so I really see this as a, another potential for major focus. Um, in addition, I think there is a need for strategic focus on mental health skills throughout the curriculum uh, and possibly looking at embedding mental health and addiction skills earlier in uh, both the uh, undergrad programs, but also to really look at a strategic focus on uh, nursing roles for mental health clinicians. Um, there is quite a quite a gap in the availability of clinicians out there, and I certainly see advanced practice nurses as being ideal uh, in this area. Um, looking at uh, building skills on trauma-informed care, developmental concepts um, are, I think, areas that we really do need to uh, put a, a major strategic focus on. And Pam, I think you have uh, quite a bit of experience in working with uh, Dr. Gottlieb's uh, book, so I'll throw it over to you on strength-based nursing. Thanks, Jocelyn. I just wanted to take the opportunity to um, put a pitch here for um, Dr. Gottlieb's book, Strength-Based Nursing Care. We have been using a strategy at SickKids to have a, um, a book club uh, meeting on a monthly basis, our clinical uh, nursing team, some of our educators, the bioethicists, a variety of, uh, uh, of leadership um, team members to uh, review on a monthly basis different chapters of her strengths-based nursing care book. And we've really found this to be quite um, an excellent strategy for challenging our thinking, um, uh, but also for acknowledging the good work that we are doing and putting some language to the important roles that nurses play in care. The emphasis of the book is really on an integrated biopsychosocial spiritual approach to care. And um, I won't say any more other than to say I think one of the things Jocelyn and I have talked about, as she mentioned, is this the importance of paying attention to the mental health and broader psychosocial um, needs in the context of acute care um, or chronic care delivery. And nurses are so well positioned for that. Um, using something like this book can really help us give the um, language and visibility to the um, interventions that nurses are doing, um, which often are invisible or embedded in um, the the, the things we're doing day to day, but don't really have um, as much visibility as I would like to see in an organization. So I would just encourage people to uh, take a look at this if you're not familiar with it. So I think um, at this point, those are the key um, um, areas that Joss and I identified as pediatric uh, nursing administrative and practice hot topics. And we'd like to stop there and uh, turn it over to you for the question period. So one of the questions that we thought would be good to get out to the group, and perhaps uh, Doug, you can facilitate it, is to ask uh, the audience whether you have additional hot topics that should be included in, in our, our uh, administrative uh, aspects. So we, we'd really like to hear your perspectives on that. Yeah, so that's a great idea. Uh, if, if the audience has any other suggestions around uh, hot topics uh, from the administrative slash practice perspective, uh, go ahead and type those into the comments box, and we can uh, we can certainly pass that information along uh, to the audience as well as to the to the presenters for for more discussion. 
But I think Pat had uh, uh, wanted to maybe uh, spend a couple of uh, seconds to just uh, summarize some stuff uh, after what we've heard while we wait for some other questions that, to, to come in. Sure. Thank you, Doug. And my role really as part of the core planning group that uh, helped to pull this webinar together is really to take a pause and to kind of reflect on what the purpose of the webinar was. I'm just going to go back to maybe some initial comments made by Nancy that the concept of having a nurses network kind of has evolved over some breakfast meetings starting in Halifax, then Ottawa, then Montreal. And definitely the passion from those who've attended, our colleagues, many of you who are on the phone, the passion to come together and to try and really uh, profile nursing within pediatrics across Canada. And so as the core group, and the core group who pulled this together from our last meeting in Montreal, and I just want to reflect on the fact that that's Nancy Lefebvre, Kristen Campbell, Cam Hubley, Jocelyn Vine, and myself, have worked the last few months because one of the asks or one of the strategies to try and pull us together from across Canada that we heard from the Breakfast Symposium last year was to use a webinar format. And so today is our first attempt at kind of wetting our appetites collectively across Canada to say, this is what we as a nurses network can try and move forward. And, you know, thanks to our great panelists who kind of put it out there, kind of that environmental kind of oversight to the areas around education, research, administration, and practice, to start is to start thinking about how can we work together to influence um, nursing um, within pediatrics within those domains. And so if I think briefly on what Margo was able to share with us and the notion of even knowing that there are 32 nursing schools across Canada and that the curriculum, the years to which it takes to get that BSCN and the content differs across that. And I think what many of us have seen and Margo was reflective of is the, the curriculum for pediatrics specifically and where are we in that. So is there an opportunity as a nurses network for those who have an interest and passion to even come to consensus on what curriculum um, should look like for pediatric nursing uh, within the schools of nursing. Within the research, and again, thanks to Denise, who really gave us a nice overview of, I mean, she said the visibility of nurse-led pediatric uh, research is variable, and I think it's almost to the point of being a little minimal. It doesn't mean, and she was clear on that, it doesn't mean it's not happening, but we're not necessarily profiling it in a way that uh, those looking for it, those from some of our other disciplines or from within, um, can actually find it. So is there an opportunity to come together to collaborate on how best to profile the wonderful work that is being done by our nurse researchers uh, across Canada? And, you know, is that uh, a central repository of where people can find things that is through the CAFTI site. And so there's potential to really learn from others on how they've done it. And I think uh, Denise alluded to how it's been done potentially in Ireland. And maybe to leverage some of the priority themes that our current nurse researchers are doing if we create that forum for that conversation uh, to, to at least start to move that forward. The declining graduates from master's and PhD is another concern. So do we have an opportunity to explore uh, how perhaps to move that forward in a more positive light. And the notion of an honors program was one that we put out there. And then finally, for what Jocelyn and Pamela, uh, Pam shared with us around administration and practice, I mean, they've identified some key topics, and I know we're waiting for a bit of response on are there other hot topics that we are currently faced with uh, within the context of our pediatric settings. And with that, I think it really leads to the, the really big question of the day, and that is we were hopeful that this webinar would kind of give the overview, start to spark some thinking amongst our colleagues who are online to really help us in planning for the symposium that is coming up on that Monday, October 20th at the CAFTI conference. And if you're not going to be present, I mean, thanks to great Kristen who from our last symposium has a bit of a, a distribution list for those who have an interest to stay connected. So we'll make sure the connections happen, but definitely coming to uh, Calgary would be a very exciting opportunity to once again come together. So based on what you heard from Jocelyn, Pam, Marco, and Denise, if you had one wish um, on challenges that you're faced with within your setting that you would hope that the nursing network 
could be helpful with in trying to move forward, what would that one thing be? And so if you don't mind typing that in, and Doug will facilitate that no doubt in a moment when I stop talking, if you don't mind typing that in, because then that information and all the other comments made throughout this webinar will help uh, the core five uh, plan for what we hope to be a very interactive and very um, exciting, when I say exciting, because I think this is exciting, September 10th, our very first webinar uh, opportunity in Calgary to um, really help shape our current activities as a nurses, nursing network. So with that, I think that is the summary of what I wanted to land with. And so Doug, I'll turn to you at this stage. Were there any further comments, Doug, that came through? I was speaking, but I had my microphone on mute. I always have to remember to unmute. Uh, we did have, uh, with your, uh, in response to your one wish question, we did have a comment come in from Barb who said uh, her one wish, I guess, is uh, provincial models for caring uh, for children with complex health care needs in the community. Excellent. Thank you, Barb. Um, yeah. And we did have a couple of uh, uh, two uh, people made uh, comments about um, the first one was that she that she believes that youth gets lost in the pediatrics and that this needs to be recognized going forward and, and followed by a similar comment about youth being need to, needing to be recognized as distinct and unique uh, separate from children just because of their unique needs. Um, going back to the uh, the hot topics that uh, Jocelyn and Pam were uh, asking for, the, the first suggestion that came in following that was from Mary, and she's suggesting that comp competence, competency development uh, in a specialty area for pediatrics, uh, considering the varying exposure to pediatrics during their undergrad uh, education. And another hot topic was around, uh, for the administrator perspective, was around lean and lean facility design, daily management techniques, continuous process improvement, and strategy deployment. Uh, and another uh, comment about hot topics around uh, the specialty for pediatrics as a, a, a suggestion has come forward for a Canadian Nurses Association's exam for specialization in pediatrics to really formalize that specialty. So any thoughts on any of those uh, while we wait for any other questions to come in? Doug, it's Elaine. Can you hear me? Yes, we, uh, faintly, but yes. Okay. If, hang on a second. I'll try and make it better. Is that better? That's better, yeah. Okay, great. I just wanted to put out a, a comment. Uh, first of all, fantastic webinar, and, and uh, my, my thanks to everyone uh, for your leadership. Just in terms of um, the hot topics that we've talked about, um, transition, complex care, I just wanted to put out a comment, and especially the one wish um, that just came through around provincial models. CAFC, for the last couple of years, has established, uh, this is more of a FYI, I guess, has established four communities of practice, two of which are focused on transition, from pediatric to adult care and um, uh, families of, of children who have complex care. And um, the, the goal of the COPs is to develop national standards um, that currently do not exist. And, and uh, we have had the uh, tremendous opportunity to work with many, many colleagues from different uh, disciplines across the country. And I, I would really invite um, those colleagues who participated on this morning's webinar to um, to check out the website, check out our Knowledge Exchange Network on the information on these communities of practice that are there now and there may be an opportunity for you to come and join us um, bringing some of the needs and hot topics that we've discussed today to, to life perhaps or, or to get a bit more involved in these areas. I just, I'll, I'll stop there, Doug. Thanks. Any thoughts on our from our panel so far? Uh, it's Jocelyn speaking. I, I think the ideas and suggestions that people are bringing forward are, are excellent. And um, I think it really points to the need for us to spend some time uh, and really be strategic about where we want and need to focus. I am particularly passionate about the comments that were made about adolescents and youth 
as a distinct group really needing uh, a focus. Uh, so personally, I, I was very interested in that, but all of the topics that people have mentioned are, are excellent. Uh, we did have a comment come in from Margo where she's suggesting as one, as one of the, the needs that she sees is a, is a need for a catalog of nursing schools that includes what they offer in terms of pediatric curriculum, including their clinical exposure. That's another suggestion. Uh, we also had a comment come in from Brenda. Uh, Brenda's uh, coming from one of the community hospitals uh, in the country, and she's suggesting that she would appreciate any information on the maintenance and documentation of bedside clinical nursing core competencies, as she indicates that this is a challenge in the community hospitals where there's a fluctuating uh, census of, pa of pediatric patients and the ability to maintain those competencies. So any other, uh, so that's all we have for the questions now. We do have about a minute left before our scheduled time to close. Um, unless there's any last minute questions that the audience wants to type in, why don't we uh, hear some closing comments from our panel before we wrap this up? So Doug, it's Pat here. I guess I just want to reiterate again, a, a huge thank you to the panelists and a huge thank you to those who did dial in. Again, it's at the beginning of our opportunity to come together through the use of the webinar through CAFC, wonderful, wonderful support uh, in order to move the nursing network forward. So for those who are coming to Calgary, please plan to come uh, and be with us for our breakfast symposium. And those who uh, have not uh, been able to sign up yet for CAFC, please plan to come. And if not there, we'll find a way to connect back so that we uh, create the momentum and the movement that we need to uh, strategically uh, move nursing forward within the domain of uh, pediatrics and youth uh, care. Thanks, Deb. Yeah, that was Thanks, you're welcome. All right. Well, with that, I guess we will uh, wrap this uh, webinar up right on time at 1230. So thank you to the audience for joining us and for contributing as much as you did in the in the comments. That was certainly made for an excellent discussion. And I'm sure everyone is looking forward, as uh, Pat said, to the session in Calgary in person. And thank you to all of our presenters, uh, Nancy, Jocelyn, Pam, Denise, uh, Pat and Margo. Uh, and we certainly look forward to the next opportunity to bring uh, the Nursing Network back to our webinar program. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we are back on schedule with our regular weekly Wednesday progr uh, programming. So uh, we certainly look forward to seeing everyone next week when we uh, bring back the Children and Youth in Challenging Contexts Network, where we are bringing, again, one of their knowledge synthesis reports, uh, this one, uh, this time on uh, protecting youth mental health and practical strategies related to violence prevention. Uh, following uh, the week after that, we will hear from CAFC's President CEO, Elaine, who we heard today on the call, as well as uh, CAFC's board chairs and vice chairs, Peter Fitzgerald from McMahon. Master Children's Hospital and Marilyn Monk uh, from uh, the Hospital for Sick Children as we uh, roll out uh, and give a preview to the CAFC community of our new strategic plan, CAFC's new strategic plan for the next five years, uh, which is titled Enabling the Best Health Care for Ch Canada's Children and Youth. So as always, you can find all this information uh, uh, on our website at cafc.org slash CAFC Presents. Uh, that's the, the name of our webinar program. So anytime you uh, see that on our website, that's uh, going to give you the information related to any of our upcoming webinars. You can always also sign up for the, the uh, email notifications and the newsletter about upcoming webinars and all of that stuff. And as I also mentioned at the beginning, this webinar is record has been recorded and will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network at uh, www.can.cafc.org. And as I mentioned, it does take a couple days to get that up. So, and you will receive an email from the system with that. So thanks again to everyone for coming and uh, we hope to see you on one of our next webinars. Bye everyone. <laughs>